Minister Indrani Raja. Madam Deputy Speaker, I thank all the MPs who have spoken for their support of the bill. The questions raised by the members fall broadly into four categories. First, how IRAS will implement GST on low-value goods imported via air or post and on a business-to-consumer or B2C imported non-digital services. Second, how IRAS will enforce collection and ensure compliance. Third, specific queries on the updated GST treatment for a supply of media sales. And fourth, feedback concerning cost of living and the GST voucher scheme. Mr. Yip Han Wing, Mr. Don Wee and Mr. Lewis Ng asked how GST on low-value goods imported by air or post and B2C imported non-digital services will be implemented. GST on low-value goods imported by air or post and B2C imported non-digital services will be implemented by widening the scope of our existing Overseas Vendor Registration, or OVR, and Reverse Charge, or RC, regimes. These regimes are not new and have been successfully implemented from 1st January 2020 to tax business-to-business -to -business or B2B imported services and B2C imported digital services. Under the OVR regime, overseas vendors such as overseas suppliers, electronic marketplace operators and re-deliverers that make significant B2C supplies of imported services and or low-value goods imported via air or post to non-GST registered customers in Singapore will register with IRAS. If they're not already registered, <clears throat> will register with IRAS if they're not already registered. They will collect GST from their customers on such supplies and then hand the collected GST over to IRAS. Non-GST registered customers in Singapore include individuals like many of us here. This approach ensures a level playing field in terms of GST treatment, whether we buy such services or goods from local suppliers or overseas vendors. Mr. Don Wee asked whether a simplified registration and compliance regime will be available for overseas vendors. Our current regime is not onerous. Overseas vendors can already choose to register under a simplified pay-only mechanism. The simplified pay-only mechanism allows overseas vendors to enjoy simplified GST reporting and documentation requirements. Under the RC regime, which is only applicable to B2B transactions, local GST registered entities will account for GST to IRAS when they import low-value goods via air or post or buy B2B services from overseas suppliers. Our RC regime does not affect most GST registered entities in Singapore. This is how we keep their tax compliance burden low. This is because they're fully taxable persons entitled to a full refund on the GST incurred on their purchases, and even if they account for GST on the low value goods imported by air or post or on imported services, they will still get a refund of this same amount. Only a small minority of GST registered entities here are subject to RC. These make non-taxable supplies such as exempt supplies or non-business supplies and cannot get a full refund of GST incurred on their purchases. This minority of GST registered entities that are subject to RC include financial institutions and residential property developers. For this minority of GST registered entities that are subject to RC, they are required to account for GST on the imported services, including services procured from overseas gig workers, regardless of the value of the services. Businesses with annual turnover of less than $1 million and not importing services exceeding $1 million are not required to register for GST and are not required to apply RC on their imported services. This is similar to how we do not require local businesses with less than $1 million annual turnover to register for GST. Mr. Yip Hon Wing asked how, under OVR, consumers will know if their payment at the point of purchase already includes GST and how Singapore Customs will know if GST has already been paid on a package. 
When consumers check out their purchases, GST-registered overseas vendors will charge and collect GST on the low-value goods at the point of purchase when the order is confirmed. This is similar to how, since 1st January 2020, GST is collected on imported B2C digital services. Where GST has been charged and collected by the overseas vendor on the low-value goods, the overseas vendor will include the relevant information on the GST collected in the commercial document which is passed through the logistics chain. Import GST will not be payable at the border when this information is furnished to Singapore Customs. For example, for goods delivered via air couriers, the GST registration number of the overseas vendor is included in the summary list of parcels to be imported or in the permit declared to Singapore Customs. Mr. Lewis Ng asked how GST-registered entities that are subject to RC can use best available information to determine if a purchase is subject to RC. As I explained earlier, only a small minority of GST-registered entities here are subject to RC. When these entities buy low-value goods, RC will apply only if the goods are imported via air or post into Singapore. Singapore Customs already collects GST for all goods imported via land and sea into Singapore. GST-registered entities that are subject to RC will usually know from its contract with the supplier whether the low-value goods it buys is located outside Singapore at the point of sale and whether the goods will be imported via air or post. However, there may be occasions in which the GST-registered entity only knows this information upon receipt of the goods. Allowing GST-registered entities that are subject to RC to use the best available information to determine whether RC applies is therefore meant to ease compliance by such entities. Apart from information available at the time of purchase of the goods, the entities can use information at the point of goods receipt or other information collected by their business systems and processes to determine the location of goods and mode of shipment into Singapore. One example of such available information is the import and shipping documents that accompany the goods. As it would be difficult to envisage all the types of available information that may be used, we will not provide a prescriptive list of information that GST-registered entities subject to RC can rely on. Instead, IRAS will provide examples on the type of documents or information in its e-tax guide. Entities subject to RC can approach IRAS for clarification if they wish to use other available information. Mr. Yip Hon Wing, Mr. Satyandi Supat and Mr. Don Wee asked how we will engage overseas vendors and ensure that they comply with the new GST regime. First, on 1st January 2020, the regime is already in place for overseas vendors that sell B2C digital services to local consumers. This has helped IRAS gain experience in administering and enforcing the regime. The rules of our OVR regime are consistent with those of other jurisdictions. This makes it easy for overseas vendors to comply and also provides certainty for the industry. Many of these overseas vendors are familiar with similar GST or value-added tax or VAT obligations in other jurisdictions. We are not the first jurisdiction to implement GST on low-value goods imported via air or post or on imported services. For instance, Australia, the European Union, New Zealand, Norway, Switzerland and the United Kingdom have extended their GST or VAT regimes to cover low-value goods. Our experience with OVR thus far since 1st January 2020 and the experience of other jurisdictions with OVR show that these multinational businesses do comply with GST or VAT obligations of the jurisdictions they make supplies to. IRAS will make use of various information sources to identify and engage overseas vendors that should be GST registered and verify their GST reporting after GST registration. In the event of non-compliance, the existing penalty and enforcement regime under the GST Act will apply. IRAS is empowered to raise additional tax assessments, apply penalties, and recover the outstanding tax payable directly or through the appointment of agents. Provisions in bilateral tax agreements will also allow IRAS to obtain information on overseas vendors from other tax jurisdictions. 
IRAS has been actively engaging the industry, including overseas vendors, on the implementation details for the OVR and RC regimes. These include consultation on IRAS draft e-tax guides and the proposed legislation. IRAS is also conducting outreach activities for potential GST registrants, including participating in workshops in various international fora and holding webinars to educate overseas vendors on the new GST rules. I'll now proceed to address questions regarding the updated GST treatment for supplies of media sales. To recap, the GST treatment for a supply of media sales will be revised from 1st January 2022 to be based on where the person who contracts for the service, for example, a local or overseas HQ, and the person who directly benefits from the service, for example, a subsidiary in Singapore, belong. Currently, the GST treatment depends on where the advertisement was circulated. With the advent of the digital economy, including online advertisements, our GST treatment needs to be updated. IRAS has provided guidance in its e-tax guide to state that the person who contracts for the service or the contractual client will generally be regarded as the only person who directly benefits from the service where two conditions are satisfied. The first condition is that the service agreement does not require the services to be provided to another person. The second condition is that the supplier of the service liaises only with the contractual client and is accountable only to the contractual client. Mr. Lewis Ng asks whether both of these conditions must be satisfied in order for the contractual client to be deemed the sole direct beneficiary and how to determine the GST treatment of the supply of media sales in the event that both conditions are not satisfied. To clarify, both conditions must be satisfied for the contractual client to be regarded as the sole direct beneficiary. IRAS has provided examples in its e-tax guide to illustrate this. Where the two conditions are not satisfied, the determination of the direct beneficiary would be dependent on the facts of the case. As a general rule, the supplier should consider the party, other than the contractual client, stated in the contract that he is required to provide his service to and to whom he is accountable for his service deliverables. For example, if the media sales supplier's contract is with an overseas HQ, but the contract requires the media sales to be first provided to a subsidiary in Singapore, or second, the media sales supplier is accountable to the subsidiary in Singapore for his service deliverables, then the subsidiary in Singapore is the direct beneficiary of the service. In both instances, the supplier will have contracted with the subsidiary in Singapore the actual recipient of his service. Therefore, regardless of the presence of multiple layers of contracts, the supplier will know the direct beneficiary of his supply of service. IRAS would include more examples in its e-tax guide to illustrate the situation where both of these conditions are not satisfied. With the extension of GST to low-value goods imported via air or post and to imported B2C non-digital services from 1st January 2023, as announced in Budget 2021, this means that GST will apply to goods and services imported into Singapore. This in turn levels the playing field for our local businesses as overseas suppliers of goods and services will be subject to the same GST treatment as local suppliers. This change also helps to defend our GST revenue base from being eroded as the digital economy grows and more people shop online. Mr. Sharel Taha asked whether the tax revenue from this measure could be used to provide more support to small retailers and help with their digital transformation. The revenue collected will form part of our total fiscal resources. We have set aside 24 billion over the next three years in Budget 2021 to enable firms and workers to transform and emerge stronger from the pandemic, of which a key focus is to support SMEs in their digital adoption. There are schemes already in place, such as SMEs Go Digital, Heartlands Go Digital, and SME Centres, to help small retailers through grant support and consultancy services with their digital transformation. Ms. Yoan Ling called for more support for micro-businesses and wider changes to support our retail ecosystem. We have implemented several schemes throughout 2020 and 2021 to help SMEs in the retail sector. We are also refreshing the Retail Industry Transformation Map, or ITM, 
which lays out a longer-term vision for the industry as part of a broader refresh of the 23 ITMs given disruptions brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Yip Hon Wing and Mr. Satyandi Supat asked how this measure would impact overall inflation and living costs in Singapore, particularly for the lower and middle income. The bulk of individuals' consumption, such as food, utilities, transport, education and healthcare, will not be affected by the change. These goods and services are typically brought, bought from local suppliers rather than from overseas suppliers and thus are not affected by the extension of GST to low-value goods imported via air or post and B2C imported non-digital services. Mr. Yip Hon Wing also asked whether additional assistance will be provided on top of the assurance package and GST voucher scheme. We have said that the government will continue to absorb GST on publicly subsidised healthcare and education. To support lower income Singaporeans, we already have other permanent schemes such as the Workfare Income Supplement, WIS, the Silver Support and Comcare. As part of our annual budget, we have also provided additional support such as the Service and Conservancy Charge, SNCC rebates and top-ups to child development and EduSave accounts. The government remains committed to supporting Singaporeans with more help given to the lower income. Let me now address the uh, queries raised by Mr. Louis Chua. Um, he had asked for the uh, GST collection from our OVR and RC regimes, and the answer to that is that it's about $250 million a year. Um, he had also asked about the number of cases of non-compliant overseas vendors uh, under the existing OVR regime detected by IRAS so far. IRAS has not detected any cases so far, and the overseas vendors are generally compliant. Um, he had asked uh, how much does the government expect to uh, collect from each of the new measures. The measures would yield about 130 million a, a year. And you have, uh, I think his final question was whether GST uh, relief um, for those um, coming back from overseas, whether there'll be any changes from that, that will not change. I think Mr. Louis Chua then uh, concluded uh, by a call to review whether or not it is necessary to raise GST. Um, let me say this, uh, first of all, uh, today is not really a, the time to have a debate on whether or not we should raise GST as a whole, um, because today's bill is focused on a very specific aspect, which is low-value goods. However, I want to just make a few general remarks, given that Mr. Chua has also uh, made a call uh, or some remarks on raising of GST, which is, is it's really this. You have to consider our revenue and you have to consider our expenditure situation. And I think members of the House know this already. In terms of our revenues, taxes and fees are only 80% of our total revenues. We are already relying on the NRIC for 20%. That's one-fifth. It's not coming from taxes alone. And the budgetary surpluses of the entire last decade have been used up because of COVID. And because of COVID and because of the pandemic, we've had to dig into our reserves, not just NRIC, but the actual reserves. And we have used up over 53 billion of that. That is our revenue situation. We are digging into the savings. On the other hand, at our, our expenditure, if you just look at the horizon, and I outlined this in my speech yesterday on the adjournment motion, we have very large expenditure items looming on the horizon. Firstly, aging population and all the health care that comes with that. Second, climate change and the need to have a sustainable future for Singaporeans. And third, renewing our social compact, bridging inequality, doing more for the vulnerable, helping those who are in need. So what do we have? You have a situation where your fiscal situation is already tight because you are digging into your, your savings and your reserves. You have got impending challenges which require you to spend more. 
And you also have the Workers' Party on top of that asking us to spend even more than that. And something, <laughs> so, I mean, the money must come from somewhere. Um, the Workers' Party uh, has attempted to put forward some suggestions. So they've suggested um, uh, tax in increases. They support the tax increase today. But you must remember that the kind of money that is raised from the, the GST in today's bill is in the millions. But if there is a GST increase of two percentage point, the amount of revenue raised per year is about three billion. You're comparing millions with billions. And the kind of expenditure that's required is billions. The other suggestion that the Workers' Party has put forward is on land sales and to treat land sales as revenue. Actually, if I, I've explained this before, but in a nutshell, what they're really saying is if, if you have, a, have land, if you have property, today it's in a physical form. When you sell it, you're just converting it to, to, to cash, to another form. And their suggestions to treat that as revenue. We don't treat it as revenue because you haven't become richer by selling it. You've just converted it from a physical form to a, a cash form. It's, it's, just not the, it's just not prudent in terms of the, the way one should run a fiscal system. Um, so I, I, I would just simply urge the, the, the Workers' Party to, to cons consider this. Our fiscal constraints, the need to spend more, um, and that the money must come from somewhere. I had also yesterday outlined why the Singapore system, the taxation system and the fiscal system is progressive and fair. It is built on principles that everybody contributes something, but those who have more contribute more. In fact, in some cases, a lot more. And what we do is we redistribute it to those who have less. In terms of GST, as I mentioned yesterday, 60% of the GST collections come from the higher income and from the foreigners who live and work in Singapore and from tourists. Tourism's down now, but when you look at the mid and longer term projections, that 60% still remains the same. So GST is a good example of how we do this redistribution. And never forget that this government will do what is necessary to support our people. When you consider the pandemic, we had five budgets. Every time the MTF is required, has, has to, had to put in place measures that affect businesses, we put in place support. So you cannot look at just one single item and say, oh, this by itself, uh, please change, it's very onerous. You do have to look at the bigger picture. And you cannot just look at a very narrow tunnel vision thing. And the other takeaway is really that this government will always make sure that whoever is in need, in genuine need, will have the support. And the only way you can do that is to have diverse revenue sources which are sustainable and for recurrent expenditure to make sure that you have recurrent revenue. That is all I plan to say about GST at this stage, but I hope that this is something that the Workers' Party will reflect on. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, let me just conclude by saying that MOF will continue to review our tax regime regularly to ensure its relevance and its effectiveness in the digital economy, and I beg to move. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as of the opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Goods and Services Tax Amendment Bill. Committee stage, what day? Now, Madam, I beg to move that Parliament will immediately resolve itself into a committee on the bill. The question is that Parliament will immediately resolve itself into a committee on the bill. As many as of the opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clauses 1 to 26 stand part of the bill. As many as of the opinions say aye. aye. 
To the contrary, say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Bill to be reported. Minister for Finance. Madam Deputy Speaker, I beg to report that the bill has been considered in committee and agreed to without amendment. Third reading, what day? Now, Madam, I beg to move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. As many as are of the opinion, say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Goods and Services Tax Amendment Bill. Leader. Madam Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that at its rising today, Parliament do stand adjourned to 1.30 p.m. tomorrow. The question is that at its rising today, Parliament do stand adjourned to 1.30 p.m. tomorrow. As many as are of the opinion, say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leader. Madam Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that Parliament do now adjourn. The question is that Parliament do now adjourn.